All right. So let's go back out to the main desktop. And the last statement here is that it uses W chains, where W is the width of P. And, and the explanation is here. We're going to see it, and then we're going to go back to this more general picture. The claim is that if you take any one of the chains, there's always a point in the chain where the prime point is labeled and the double prime point is not. And then those points form an anti-chain. All right, now let's see why. So the claim is, and we've already explained this part. So here's our optimum chain partition. Or we, have, we, we hope it's optimum. So what we do is we find a point in each chain when there's a singleton, you know which point it'll be. It'll be that point. And in every case, what we mean is that if that point is x, we mean x prime is labeled and x double prime is unlabeled. Now, there's x1, there's x2, there's x3, x4, x5, and x6. And the claim is that this is an antichain. And now let's explain that. Suppose there's any incomparability among them. So let's suppose that xi is less than xj in P. All right, now think about the picture where we have these guys highlighted. I've got to get more of them to have this make sense. All right. Somewhere up there, you have xi prime, and you have xi double prime. Somewhere else, you have xj prime and xj double prime. But if xi is less than xj, that means that's an edge. Because that's how we built the graph. Now, let's indicate whether it's labeled or unlabeled. This guy is supposed to be labeled. This guy is supposed to be unlabeled. This guy is supposed to be labeled. This guy is supposed to be unlabeled. What's the flow on that edge? What's the flow on that edge? Why'd you say one? No, capacity one, not flow. All edges have capacity one, not flow. What's the flow on that edge? In the, in the, you know, I've got the optimum flow. I've halted. What's the flow on that edge? Yeah? Is, is xi to the left, is that unlabeled or labeled? Yeah. So uh, the two on the left are labeled. The two on the right are unlabeled. That's not my best handwriting, is it? That's supposed to be labeled. These two guys are labeled. These two guys are unlabeled. I'm asking, that is an edge in my bipartite graph. When the algorithm halts with the maximum flow, 
That edge has capacity one, but what's the flow on it? Why? You're right, but, but why? Bob is screaming at you. It's one, it's one, it's one, and you're saying it's zero. Why? If it's one, it's a matching edge. What does a matching edge do? It puts the two points consecutive in a chain. These two guys come from different chains. They come from different chains. They're not consecutive in a chain. They're different chains. So the flow on that edge is zero. Now, if that edge is labeled and that edge is empty, I can label that vertex forward plus one. If this edge is labeled, if I can get some flow here, and there's a forward edge and it's empty, that vertex will not be unlabeled, it will be labeled. Contradiction. Conclusion. The selected points form an antechain of size equal to the current chain partition. End of story. All right. Now, let's wrap it up and see that we're all on this page together. I give you a post set with a thousand points, say a data file. And I ask you, find its width and find a partition into W number of chains. What work do you carry out? You set up, given a post set, a bipartite graph using the rule that we've just explained. When x is less than y, you have x prime joined to y double prime. You turn on Ford Fulkerson and you find a maximum matching in this bipartite graph and run it until it halts so that you have the labeling conditions that you know that some vertices are labeled and some vertices are unlabeled in this bipartite graph. You use the maximum matching to assemble a chain partition. And the rule is, when an edge, x prime, y double prime, is a matching edge, when it's a matching edge, then I go over in a chain partition and I put x immediately under y in a chain. And I, that just assembles these chains. Again, don't forget loose points, because you can't have chains of size one. Then, how do I get a maximum anti-chain? I look at the chains that I've assembled, and I scan them over here in the bipartite graph. For every chain, there is a point. There may be many. There may be many. Where over here, the prime point is labeled, and its mate, the double prime, is unlabeled. Pick one out of every chain. That's an anti-chain. So you not only have the chain partition, you have the anti-chain that witnesses that it's optimum. So when we first studied Dilworth's theorem months ago, I commented that, and, and it's a repeat of, of, of the principle that I expressed a few minutes ago, that if you studied this subject 40 years ago, you would have learned about Dilworth's theorem. You would have learned that a post set of width W has a partition into W chains. The idea of how one actually finds that partition would probably have not even been on the curriculum. But in the modern world, with the emphasis on doing things and understanding how they work, uh, this becomes a, a little bit of a capstone for our algorithms discussion, because think of everything that's involved with knowing how to find a Dilworth partition. You first of all have to understand breadth first search and Dijkstra. You have to be able to find distances in directed graphs. That's step one. 
Step two, you have to understand network flows. And there you're getting the instance of a, a primal dual class of algorithms, where the primal one is the network flow problem and the dual problem is Dijkstra, that you keep solving in an iteration. And every time you iterate it, you get an improvement in your network flow. You're also using the integer solution property of network flows. Fundamentally important that network flow problems posed in integers have integer solutions. So then when you reduce down to the special class of problems where you're talking about network flows, where all capacities are one, then you know that there is a solution where all your flow values are either zero or one. Take the edge or don't take the edge. That's called making a, an arithmetic problem combinatorial. There's no 0.7, there's no square root of two, there's just zero and one. And then it's going between posets and bipartite graphs and using this special understanding of the labeling conditions in order to extract what you need the formation of the antichain that witnesses that your chain partition is optimum. That's a really nice package. And if you've understood what I said in the last couple of minutes, then you really learned something in this course. And that's a good thing.